we are going to listen to Jeff Greenblatt, who is the founder and CEO of Emerging Futures, talk about refueling Starship with methane oxygen propellant on the lunar surface using polar volatiles. Take it away, Jeff. All right, thank you, Ben. Um, and so for those of you who were hoping to hear about lunar landing pads, uh, that is a topic that I decided to uh, hold off on discussing this time because I'm in the midst of submitting an NSF proposal on this topic and just felt it was a little premature to be discussing publicly that concept. So uh, you can uh, cross your fingers for me and hope that uh, I get funded through that. But in the meantime, I thought I would talk about another topic which is somewhat related, which is also using lo lunar volatiles uh, to make uh, carbon-based uh, molecules, in this case, meth methane oxygen. Uh, and exploring the question of whether we, there's enough there in order to refuel Starship for, for lunar missions. So with that, I will take it away. So as probably all of you know, um, NASA has selected SpaceX, among others, to deliver human payloads to the moon. Starship is the uh, platform that they are hoping to use. Um, and uh, as you probably also all know, uh, SpaceX has embraced methane oxygen for uh, Starship due to several, several reasons. Um, it's a lot easier to handle, for instance, than uh, uh, super cold hydrogen oxygen. There's other um, reasons why uh, it seems to be a, a better choice right now. The cost is much lower than making liquefied hydrogen. And uh, it's also a, a fuel that is in many ways better than the kerosene-based uh, fuel that's used with uh, Falcon 9. However, using um, methane oxygen comes with a challenge uh, if you're um, primarily operating on or around the Earth or on the way to Mars and back, there's plenty of CO2 around and plenty of um, uh, natural gas, of course, on Earth to make uh, methane. But uh, on the Moon, uh, the major propellant that everybody is focused on is hydrogen oxygen. So the question is, how are they going to refuel on the Moon or, or will they? And so I'm going to talk about the possibility of refueling uh, and making uh, methane for Starship, for a Starship-sized uh, spacecraft. Of course, other spacecraft could use it as well. Um, so uh, we are looking toward the polar cold traps, which have been known for some time to contain a fairly large amount of, uh, of uh, ice water. But there were a lot of other volatiles that came out of the L-Cross and LAMP um, impact experiments back in 2010. Uh, which haven't gotten as much attention. And so what I show here is a pie chart showing the mass shares of various uh, volatiles that were detected in those experiments and breaking things down by element on the left, you see that there's about 1.4% of carbon-based uh, uh, molecules. And uh, here's the, the various species that were identified in those experiments, uh, CO, uh, methanol, CO2, and uh, ethylene, among others. Uh, also, there is a small amount of nitrogen uh, in the form of ammonia and uh, about 2% of sulfur compounds. And so uh, with all of these different uh, elements present in the, uh, in the, uh, the frozen uh, poles, uh, it looks like you actually have the ingredients to make a lot of interesting organic chemistry. And so I have been looking at this, uh, particularly with the possibility of making hydrocarbon-based uh, molecules. And so um, the subject of last year's ISDC talk was talking about making polymers uh, using the, the, the polar volatiles. And of course, you can do other things with this as well. Um, but also, there's the possibility of making propellants such as methane oxygen, also uh, MMH NTO, which is a popular uh, propellant for uh, lower uh, performance activities, which would be good maybe for refueling uh, satellites in orbit, as well as other C and N containing propellants. Um, in addition, you can, you can use these starting ingredients to make various solvents, industrial chemicals, and other key elements. Uh, other key chemicals of what will eventually hopefully be a robust industrial ecosystem based on the moon. And so I'm very excited about this possibility and wanted to walk through the, uh, the calculations that I've done, figuring out uh, what you can do if you're just focused on making methane. So um, let's start with uh, some delta V calculations and, and payload capacities, because I think that's important for grounding this, this analysis. So. Uh, Starship is a very big rocket. As you know, it's not flying yet, but uh, from the information that has been disseminated, um, it looks like it will have a capability eventually of uh, transporting about 150 tons to low Earth orbit uh, from the Earth's surface. And from there, it then gets refueled uh, with a series of uh, uh, um, 
of refueling missions from the ground to give it an additional six kilometers per second delta V, which is enough to get it uh, all the way to Mars if you use an aerobrake um, uh, type landing in order to save on delta V when you, when you enter the vicinity of Mars. Um, so most of the delta V is, is to get out of the Earth's uh, orbit and to inject into a, uh, into a trajectory toward, toward Mars. Um, so it turns out that this delta V amount is almost exactly what is needed to go to the moon as well. Uh, the moon doesn't have as deep of a gravity well. It also doesn't need to uh, get on a, uh, a, a uh, parabolic trajectory like you do for uh, going to Mars. And so when you work out all the, um, the math, the, uh, the delta V is almost exactly the same. However, going back from Mars, um, we need a lot more delta V. And so this is one of the reasons why in Elon Musk's design, uh, you don't have nearly the same payload capacity for returning from Mars to Earth. You can bring some things back, but it turns out to just be about a third of that uh, nominal capacity or about 50 tons, which is still enormous, but you can't bring back everything that you, uh, that you left with. And that's because of the extra two kilometers or so delta V that you need in order to escape from Mars's deep gravity well. And then of course you do um, an aerobrake uh, capture at Earth and eventually landing, landing on the surface or, or into uh, Earth orbit. So what's interesting with these calculations is that uh, because as I said, you have about the same delta V to get from LEO to either Mars or the moon, what is the delta V to return from moon to LEO? And it turns out that it's a lot lower. Um, again, it's a much uh, shallower gravity well than Mars and um, uh, the other parts of the journey don't require as large of a delta V share. And so here we're looking at, even though we have a propulsive launch and a propulsive injection into an, an, an Earth orbit, again, you're using the air braking of the Earth's atmosphere to take up most of that delta V change. This is what the Apollo astronauts did. And so you're actually looking at just about uh, three kilometers per second, maybe a little less. And so what this means is that you can actually grow that payload capacity very significantly, uh, almost half the, uh, the total gross mass of the spacecraft. And so this can be used to, to transport an enormous quantity of various things. And it doesn't require as much of the methane oxygen propellant as a result. So one of the things that I'm gonna be exploring here, of course you can transport whatever you want, but what if this payload capacity was used to transport hydrogen and oxygen that's perhaps being produced on the, mar on the uh, lunar surface? Um, so there's a large capacity for that. Um, so with that in mind, um, and uh, also, um, mentioning that there would be fairly small amounts of uh, uh, modifications needed to Starship because a lot of the oxygen capacity that is already built in for the, for the outbound trip could be repurposed for carrying the cryogenic oxygen back from the lunar surface. And the only difference would be that you would have to carry a cryogenic uh, system to, to hold the hydrogen during the journey. Um, so what I've done is I've looked at a, uh, a potential scenario where you're mining about 1,200 tons of water ice uh, per year at one of the, the poles, probably the South Pole, and asking the question, along with this purified water, what else is produced or what else could be produced that could be of use for uh, this purpose here? And so uh, we start with um, looking at that, that yield of water. And uh, one of the first things that uh, we want to recognize is that if you're making this for um, rocket propellant, you don't actually use all of the oxygen. You only use about three quarters of the oxygen because of the lean um, uh, uh, fuel oxygen ratio, which is, which is used for uh, most forms of propulsion. It's true for methane oxygen as well, but it's especially pronounced for hydrogen oxygen. And so you have a little bit of this oxygen left over, which you can use for something else. Uh, in addition, the other volatiles that we mentioned a few slides back uh, can be used to make various things. And through a number of different chemical conversion options, you can take all those carbon containing compounds and convert it um, principally into methane. Uh, there are other things that you can do as well. I'm not gonna worry about that, but just focusing on the carbon part, uh, assuming that you have very high efficiency conversion, you can make about 400 tons per year of, of uh, uh, methane from these volatiles, plus a pretty commendable amount of oxygen as well, in addition to what's coming out from the water. So another 400 tons or so of, of oxygen. And with that, you then have the potential to, um, to provide propellant for about one um, annual launch of Starship, because it requires 640 tons of propellant in order to bring uh, that, that payload back to, uh, to LEO. 
And so uh, if you have this amount of launch capacity, um, this, this allows us to uh, transport roughly 60% of the annual production of the, of the water-based pro propellant that would be produced in such a system. And so if you're using Starship to, to actually transport the Hydrolox fuel, you can get about 60% um, of it off the surface, but using a methane-based fuel, so you're not eating into any of the, the hydrogen-oxygen uh, propellant that is presumably much more precious and wants to be sold in lower Earth orbit, uh, Lagrange points or other other locations in space or elsewhere on the on the lunar surface. Now, uh, with this scheme, you're actually not even using all the methane. Uh, you're basically limited by the amount of oxygen available. And so, if you now also in uh, uh, expand your scope to produce some oxygen through regolith mining, okay, regolith is available everywhere. It's about 40% oxygen by mass. You get some valuable metals out of the process as well. It is very energy intensive. Uh, but so is electrolysis of, uh, of water, uh, to be fair. And so if you're looking at uh, mining about uh, 1,100 tons of uh, raw regolith from, from anywhere around the lunar surface, but presumably right in the vicinity of the, uh, the, the water mining that you're doing, you can get another 450 tons of oxygen. And that's enough to now um, transport 100% of the uh, hydrogen oxygen um, product that you are producing. Uh, into orbit or all the way to LEO, and you still haven't used up all of the methane that is available. And so now if you grow this regolith mining operation even more, so now we're at nearly 2,000 tons per year, uh, about three quarters of uh, more than the water mining operation, you can now use up all the methane um, and you have plenty of oxygen, and now you can produce um, enough lift capacity to lift an additional 300 tons per year of something else besides the, uh, the water oxygen. So um, there's an enormous capacity in this. And this translates into roughly 2.3 annual launches of the Starship. Um, so all, all to say, I'm not suggesting that Starship should be used to transport um, water ice or water-based propellant uh, off of the surface of the moon, but it could be. Uh, probably other uses for it would be to tra transport um, other kinds of um, uh, goods or uh, simply people that are going back and forth if we have sustainable human presence on the moon. Um, and so all this payload could be used for a variety of those, of those applications. Um, so I now want to talk about a few different water mining um, uh, scenarios because I kind of threw the 1200 tons per year out there as just a reference point and I actually selected that in order to be able to without any regolith mining, be able to supply at least one annual Starship launch per year, but it was otherwise arbitrary. And so now if we look at some of the um, recent uh, projections or reference missions that have been developed, uh, they range all the way from a kind of a low of around 15 tons of water per year, which is a NASA study published last year, all the way out to something on the order of 28,000 tons, uh, which comes out of an analysis by WGM, which is a Canadian mining company, who was looking at very large amounts of uh, water mining operations uh, for profit on the moon. And by 2040, they expected uh, this amount might be possible. In addition, there are some very important references from 2018, ULA um, developed an estimate that would be mining water for various purposes, both on the moon and in orbit. But the total winds up being about 2,500 tons or roughly double the scenario that I had analyzed. And then recently, Colorado School of Mines came out with a, a number that was slightly lower than that. So on the right, you can see the number of annual Starship la launches that would be supported, assuming that you have regolith mining to provide all the O2 you need, and you're basically consuming all the carbon, uh, all the methane that is available. And this ranges from basically an, an insubstantial number of launches. You can't support Starship with the amount of water mined uh, that, uh, that NASA is proposing. But anything from our analysis level on up, you can support many Starship launches. And what's really interesting is looking out to this 2040 projection from WGM, you could support a launch per week with the amount of methane that is produced incidentally to the amount of, uh, of water that is being mined. And finally, I want to point attention to the fact that I have two columns here. There is uh, this 540 ton payload maximum, which is really what you get if you use the full gross mass limit of Starship and basically reapportion all that propellant mass that you save, not having to climb out of as, as deep of a gravity well and, and uh, use it all for payload lift, payload lift. On the other hand, if you stick with 150 ton payload assumption, 
So you're basically using a, a less than fully loaded Starship. You can now increase the number of launches quite substantially. It's about a factor of 3.5. And so now we're looking at, you know, more than eight launches from uh, our base case of 1,200 tons of, uh, of water per year, all the way out to about two launches per week if you're following the WGM scenario. So all to say, I think that uh, assuming that the LCROSS and LAMP measurements are uh, robust and that they hold up to scrutiny as we launch Viper and other um, ground truth missions to verify the amounts of uh, volatiles, uh, carbon-containing volatiles in particular that are found in the polar cold traps, uh, there is a substantial amount of uh, carbon material in order to make things like propellant and, and others. Um, so in the last part of the talk, before I switch to Q&A, I know I've provided a lot of information already. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, potential economics of, of such a system. And uh, realizing this is preliminary, um, and I'm very open to comments from the audience, particularly if I, they think I've gotten something wrong, I'm happy for, for feedback, but this is what I've come up with. Um, there are a number of estimates of Starship's operational costs out there. And so this $2 million per launch is extremely ambitious. I, I believe it represents a mature uh, industry number. So basically that all of the R&D investment has been, has been paid for. And this is just largely operational costs and a little bit going into the amortization of building the, the, uh, the spacecraft themselves. But if you believe this number, that eventually we can get down to $2 million per launch, and this is just the launch of a Starship type uh, spacecraft into low Earth orbit. If you're then going to refill it in order to go to the moon or Mars, you would have uh, a tanker version of Starship. You, you have roughly another eight launches of those that would have to go up. And so that's, uh, those would also be around $2 million. Uh, and this does include the cost of the booster as well. And so this roughly increases this cost to LEO by about tenfold. So we're looking at roughly 120 kilograms dollars per kilogram to go to the moon or Mars, which is still incredibly low compared to the kinds of numbers that we're looking at today. But this shows the incredible leverage of having a fully reusable, large capacity vehicle such as Starship uh, for us to play with. And so this, this is the, uh, the basis for my cost analysis. Um, next, we needed to make an estimate for what the, the mass of the ISRU hardware would be on the lunar surface that actually converts the water and the volatiles into these useful materials. And so using some numbers, uh, as guidance from a study that Colorado School of Mines did last year, I came up with a conservative estimate of about 8% of the annual water ice output, or roughly 100 tons, which is about triple what people are assuming for just producing water ice, but we have more complexity in the system, including the regolith mining, so I wanted to up that. Development costs, roughly $50,000 per kilogram of hardware, also coming from this Colorado School of Mines study, and about $1,500 per kilogram for very, sort of undefined maintenance costs. And when you add this all up, um, oh, and of course, there's some, some uh, financial assumptions here too. So I'm assuming kind of ambitiously that maybe this can be gotten for 5% interest and could last for 20 years. Um, I'm actually a little skeptical that we can do a 20 year life for a lunar system today, but maybe after a couple of iterations, we'll be able to make it last that long. It's certainly uh, the case for, for Earth-based systems, 20 years or longer. All right, so the bottom line is you put all this together and I think that you would be able to operate a system using these assumptions to then deliver payload from the moon to LEO for just shy of $500 a kilogram. And what's interesting about this number is this is close to the number that the ULA study had uh, come out with a couple years ago for just producing water on the moon. Of course, they were using more expensive transport costs as part of that, so I'm not surprised that their number was higher. But to be able to transport uh, water to low Earth orbit was more in the order of $3,000 a kilogram. So if this is something that is, in fact, possible, um, this would make for a, a very attractive offer uh, to get water to low Earth orbit. However, remember that this also assumes that the cost of getting anything off the surface of the Earth using Starship would be a lot lower. And if you're only going into LEO, it's more on the order of $13 a kilogram. So how in the world could $440 compete with $13 a kilogram? Well, it really can't. Uh, certainly not for today's development costs that I've shown here. If in the future, these uh, costs have been uh, uh, reduced significantly because of mass production, we have much larger operations, things are mature, you know, if maybe we drop the cost by about tenfold, we're looking at more like $60 a kilogram, but you really have to get these hardware costs of practically to zero in order to make it directly competitive. And so now we're basically saying that the cost of operations 
going from the moon to Leo, refueling in Leo using Earth-based propellant and then going back to the moon, winds up being just about the same as the cost of delivering hydrogen and oxygen directly from the Earth up to Leo. And so that's a really interesting conclusion uh, that has come out of this as well. But I'm not going to hang my hat on this yet because I think that uh, there are probably some details that need to be examined and I would love to get feedback from, from all of you as to what I might have missed. But it does get, provide some food for thought. Um, so with that, I'm just going to briefly summarize and then open it up for questions. So what we have found in doing this study is that there are more than enough uh, uh, carbon-based uh, compounds trapped in the polar ice along with water to provide plenty of methane for transport um, off the moon's surface to other places in cislunar space or uh, maybe even to Mars. Um, if you increase the amount of oxygen available by doing regolith reduction, then you can fully utilize the amount of, of methane that is available there. And you also get metals and other valuable byproducts. Um, if you don't use the hydrogen oxygen uh, that you're mining as propellant to get the material off the surface, you essentially double the amount of uh, export mass that you have available if you have this other source of propellant, such as the methane oxygen that I've been talking about. And you avoid the complexity of operating a deep cryogenically cooled hydrogen rocket. Um, this I've already said. Uh, these are just kind of the numbers to summarize. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the competition with uh, Earth-sourced hydrogen and oxygen, however, does require a very mature uh, hardware system where, where basically it's a very small cost, a uh, small component of the total uh, transportation cost, which would then dominate the system. And then you're basically neck and neck. Um, so with that, happy to answer some questions. Here's how to get a, a hold of me. Um, look forward to the discussion. All right. Thanks, Jeff. That was really interesting. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any at all? Might take a couple minutes to sink in. It might, it might. Uh, Paul asks, can he ask about the original topic? I can give it a go. There might be a limit to how much I can say, but go, go ahead, Paul. Yep. Hey, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, so the reason I was so excited about your original topic is because I'm a roadway design engineer and a software developer, and um, I'm interested in computational geometry. And if your, if your materials technology for landing pads uh, turns out to be the way to pave on the moon, then it might be used for roads. Yes. Um, and then when you've got uh, horizontal curves and vertical curves and um, super elevation, I'm using roadway terms if, if you need to know what those are. Just okay. let me know. They make sense, but no, they're not terms I'm super familiar with. Yeah. Go ahead. So they, obviously, they do uh, turns on the plane um, in arc segments, and they in the vertical, they change direction, they change slope in parabola segments. Mm -hmm. And then um, when they're in a turn, they lift one side of the road to aid in not slipping off of the road. Right, banking, yep. Banking, yes, mm -hmm. that's what super elevation is. Mm -hmm. Well, all of, all of that um, entails non-trivial geometry. Um, if you have a big paving machine where you're pouring liquid asphalt into it, um, it's, it, it is pretty easy to do and they're doing it all the time. But if you have to make plates in a factory and then drive them out to your site and then tap them into place, basically if you have to custom make bricks, then you need to have the geometry precise at the fabrication site. Right. Um, so my first question, and I'm going to leave my mic open uh, because I might have a follow-up. My first question is, um, are those things you've anticipated and any comments you might have that spring from, cool. from my little speech? Yeah. Well, so briefly, because I'm sure you aren't the only one who was hoping to hear about the other topics. So I have been exploring uh, the use of the same resources in order to make polymers that can be uh, mixed with uh, 
with lunar regolith in order to make a hard landing pad material. And certainly it can be used for making roads and other hard structures as well. Uh, as far as how they would be, so I haven't thought about the complex geometry that you've, you've been talking about where things would have to be customized sort of on a continual basis, you know, that every segment has to be slightly different, I guess is what you're saying. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. Um, but, you know, if you have the capability of uh, creating a hard substance that presumably is soft at some point during its development, right, uh, pre-curing, uh, and I am not anticipating this is something that would necessarily be done out in vacuum on the lunar surface, but will be done in a controlled environment and then, uh, and then transported, as you said, then I think that we are well within, uh, you know, the technical capabilities of being able to do that if you have a continuous process such as a 3D printer or, you know, an extrusion system that can be controlled um, and, and you have the ability to then transport fairly large segments, which would be easier in one six gravity, right, than, than here on Earth. So um, that is something that I certainly hope to look at. Uh, making landing pads that are basically circular and might have variable thickness uh, as you go out from the center, uh, it kind of presents a bit of a similar problem. So. Yeah, I mean, these things are not entirely unrelated, but I would love to have an offline conversation with you. Um, that would be great. Um, so I've got your email address, and I just followed you on Twitter while you were talking. So um, awesome. I'd like to continue the conversation. I, and forgive me for bragging, but let's call it networking. Um, I, I've, got some, I've, I've got some software that's uh, open source, but it's still in development for roadway design. So you wouldn't have to pay the big boys a lot of money. Um, Great. Okay. That could be, you know, it will be extended. It, it just depends on who, who uh, expresses an interest in it. And I think I may have some, uh, some solutions or, or could develop some solutions. So I would like to continue offline. Let's do that. And let's make sure we still have time for a couple other questions if there are any. But thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Yep, we still got time for at least one more if anybody has one. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Oh, now we're getting some. Uh, let's see. Molly says, this is probably a dumb question, and I might have just missed when you talked about it, but why was the main export for your calculations water? Uh, it's not a dumb question, Molly. Um, yeah, most of the focus in the research community and also the commercial space community with regards to the moon has been on figuring out ways to extract and do useful things with the water because we're excited that there is water on the moon. And so uh, there are a number of schemes that have been centered around, you know, extracting and purifying this water either for life support, but, but also for pr propellant because there seems to be so much of it available. So the idea is building you know, essentially an ecosystem around using hydrogen, oxygen, propellant. Uh, so that's kind of the driving force that there will be an interest in mining water for these multiple purposes. And my thought was you leverage the, the already existing infrastructure and get this uh, propellant, this other propellant, carbon-based propellant out sort of for free. I mean, not quite for free, but along the ride, uh, piggybacking as it were. So hope that answers the question. There are there any other questions for Jeff? Um, I see there's a question from Chris Wolf. Um, seems like the main benefit of vol volatile harvesting on the moon will be for local use, especially carbon compounds for hydroponics. Yeah, potentially. If you don't have full closure and you're losing the carbon somehow, then, uh, or certainly just to set it up for the beginning, uh, there could definitely be a, a use for carbon for that kind of use too. But remember that in just about any operation, the mass of propellant that you're using to get things off the surface is gonna dwarf just about any other use of a resource on the lunar surface. And so I would think that you could make propellant and have uh, a small fraction that you would uh, maybe keep for, uh, you know, for gardening or uh, making, making plastics or things like that and still be able to, to supply uh, propellant for Starship. Sounds good. All right. All right. We're at the, uh, the end of the half hour. So thanks a lot, Jeff. Okay. Really good. Appreciate Thank you. It. All right. Sorry for the and, surprise, uh, folks. I hope you learned something. If it wasn't the topic you were hoping to hear about, but we'll, uh, you'll hear about the other one soon, I hope. That was really interesting. All right. Thanks All right. so much.